So for the last lecture in this unit, what we are going to do is actually look at some examples of algorithms and see how to compute their uh, upper bounds. So we will look at two basic classes of algorithms in this uh, unit, in this uh, lecture. So we will look at some iterative examples and some recursive examples. So an iterative example will basically be something where there is a loop. And a recursive program, of course, will be something where you have to solve a smaller problem before you can solve the larger problem. So you have to recursively apply the same algorithm to a smaller input. So our first example is a very standard problem which you must have done in your basic programming course. Suppose we want to find the maximum element in an array A. So what we do is we initially assume that the maximum value is the first value and then we scan the rest of the array and wherever we see a value which is bigger than the current maximum value max val, we replace it. And at the end of the scan, we return the value of max val that we have found, which should be the largest value that we saw in the entire array. Now remember that we said that if we have two phases, in this case we have one phase where we do an initialization, we have three phases actually, we do then a loop and then we do a return. It is enough to look at the bottleneck phase. We said that if we have two parts, F1 and F2, then the order of magnitude of F1 plus F2 is the maximum of the order of magnitudes of F1 and F2. So in this case, it is clear that this loop is what is going to take the most amount of time. So it's enough to analyze the complexity of this loop. So now this loop takes exactly n minus 1 steps. Okay, so the worst case, any input is the worst case because we must go from beginning to end in order to find the maximum value. We cannot assume anything about where the maximum value lies. Now when we are scanning the loop, in every iteration we do at least one step. So this is a comparison, okay, one basic operation and this may or may not happen. Okay, so the assignment happens if we find a new value AI which is bigger than max val. But since we are ignoring constants, we can treat this as some C operations, some constant number of operations per iterations. So we have some C times n minus 1 basic operations. Okay? And if we ignore the C and we ignore this minus 1, overall this algorithm is linear. It is takes order n time. So let's now move on to an example in which we have two nested loops. So supposing we are trying to find whether or not an array has all distinct values, that is no two values in the array A are the same. So what we will do is, we will take this array A, right, and then we will compare every AI and every AJ, and if I ever find an AI equal to AJ, then I will return false, right. If I find no such AI and AJ, then I will not return false, I will return true. Now the point is that in order to, uh, in order to optimize this, if I am at, at position I, then I will only look at elements to its right, right. So I will start with i plus 1 and go to n minus 1 and this will be my range for j, right. So in order to not compare a i a j and then a j a i just to avoid this duplicate thing, what we have written is for i equal to 0 to n minus 1, so as I look at each element, for j equal to i plus 1 to n minus 1, to, to its right, check if a i is equal to a j, right. So now if I look at the number of times this actually executes, then when i is equal to 0, okay, j varies from 1 to n minus 1, so there are n minus 1 steps, right. When i is equal to 1, there are n minus 2 steps and so on. So as I go down, when i is equal to n minus 1, there will be 1 step, right. Uh, sorry, when i is equal to n minus 2, there will be 1 step. And when i is equal to n minus 1, the outer loop will terminate, but the inner loop won't run at all because we will go from n to n minus 1, right. So overall what we are doing is we are doing 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus n minus 2 plus n minus 1 steps. So this is a familiar summation, the summation of i is equal to 1 to n minus 1 of i, right. And this you should know is n minus 1 into n by 2. This is a very familiar recurrence. And this we have already seen actually, this is O n square, right. So if you just ignore constants, you have an n square by 2 minus n by 2. O n square, actually we showed that it is theta n square, but for this moment we are only looking at upper bounds. So let's say that this algorithm is O n square. So it's not a trivial O n square in the sense it's not uh, two nested loops of equal size. It's not i equal to 0 to n, j equal to 0 to n. 
is i equal to 0 to n minus 1 and j equal to i plus 1 to n minus 1. But still, the summation 1, 2, 3, 4 up to n is O n square. And this is something we will see often, so it's useful to remember this. So this is another example of a nested loop and this is one which has three nested loops. Now here what we are trying to do is we are trying to multiply two square matrices A and B. Right? So we have two matrices A and B and we are trying to compute the product C. Now in this product C, okay, if I want the ijth entry, then what I have to do is I have to look at row i in the first matrix, column j in the second matrix and then I have to Pairwise, I have to do the first entry here, this row times the first entry in that column, so I have to multiply those two, then I have to multiply the second entry, and so on, and then I have to multiply the last entry, and then I have to add that up. So that's what this uh, program is saying. So this is for each row, for i equal to 0 to n minus 1, then for each column, for j equal to 0 to, so this is going through all possible entries, c i j. Now it's saying that for this new entry, I start by assuming c i j is 0, and then I run through this row, k equal to 0 to n minus 1, I look at a i k that is the kth element in the row, b k j the kth element in this column, multiply them and add it to c i j. Okay? So this is a, a loop, outer loop of size n, this is another outer loop, inner loop of size n and the innermost loop of size n, so this is order n cubed. Okay? So this is a natural example of an n cubed algorithm. So our final iterative example is one to find the number of bits in the binary representation of n. So this is just the same as dividing n by 2 until we reach 1 or 0. Right? So let's assume that n is a non-negative number, so n is 0 or 1. So we assume by saying that the number of bits is at least 1. Okay? And then so long as we have a number which is bigger than 1, we will add one more to the count number of digits. And then this is a, a, a short form for integer division. So we will replace n by n by 2. So for instance, supposing we start with a number like 9, okay, then we will start with count is equal to 1 because that's how it says. Then while n is bigger than 2, I will divide by 2 and add 1 to the count. So I will replace count, make it 2 and I will make this 4. Then I will say that it's still greater than 1, so I will make this 3 and I will make this two, 4 by 2. Then I will say this is still bigger than 1, so I will make this 1 and I will make this 4. So now I have count equal to 4, I have n equal to 1, so this loop exits and I return count. So it says that it requires 4 bits to represent the number 9, which is correct because the number 9 in binary is 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay. So now what is the complexity of this loop? Well, how many times does this execute? Well, it will execute as many times as it takes for n to come down from its value to, so I want n, n by 2, n by 4, etc. to come down to 1. Okay, so how many times should I divide n by 2, okay, to reach 1? And this is the same as going backwards. How many times should I multiply 1 by 2 to reach n, okay? So dividing n by 2 repeatedly reach 1 is the same as multiplying 1 by 2 repeatedly to reach n and this is nothing but the definition of the law. Right? What power of 2 reaches n? So this iterative loop actually though it doesn't decrement by 1, decrements by halving n each time, we can still calculate it explicitly as requiring log to the base 2 n steps. So we have seen iterative examples of linear time, quadratic time, cubic time, that is n, n squared, n cubed, and also a linear example with log n time. So now let's look at one recursive example to see how we would try to do this when we have a recursive solution. So we won't look at a formal algorithm, but rather a formal puzzle. So this is a well-known Towers of Hanoi. So in the Towers of Hanoi puzzle, we have, as we see in this picture here, we have three wooden pegs, which we will call for the moment. A, B and C. Right? So we have pegs A, B and C. And our goal is to move these end disks from A to B. Right? So the thing that we are not allowed to do is to put a larger disk on a smaller disk. So if we take the small disk and move it here, okay, so we move the first disk here, then we must take the second disk and move it there because we can't put the second disk on top of the first disk. Right? So the goal is to 
do this in an effective way. So the actual goal is to move everything from A to B. Okay, and this is our intermediate thing because as we saw, if we move the first disk from A to B, we are stuck. We can't move anything else onto B. So we must use C as a kind of transit peg or a temporary auxiliary peg in order to do this job. So if you haven't seen this problem before, you might want to think about it in your spare time. But this is a very classical puzzle and it has a very standard recursive solution. And the standard recursive solution is the following that you first assume that you know how to solve the problem for n minus 1 disks. So at this moment you want to move n disks from A to B. So what you do is you first move n minus 1 disks. So you have on A only the bottom disk left and you have now B empty and you have moved all the other n minus 1 disks to C. So there are now n minus 1 disks here. Right? So you have assumed that you can do this using B as my transit text. So now I move things from A to C. Now what I do is I move this disk here. So I now have this here and I no longer have anything here. So now I have one biggest disk on B so I can put anything on it and I have n minus 1 disk on C. So what I do is I apply the same algorithm for n minus 1 to move things from here to here using now A as my transit text. Right? So this is a recursive way to solve the problem. You move n, mi n minus 1 disk from A to C, move the biggest disk from A to B, and then move n minus 1 disk back from C to B. So the question we want to ask ourselves is how many times do we move disks in this procedure? So supposing we write m of n to indicate the number of moves we need to transfer n disks from one peg to another peg. So what we have seen is that in order to transfer n disks, we first transfer n minus 1 disks from A to C, then we transfer 1 disk from A to B, and then n minus 1 disk back from C to B. So it's m minus n plus minus m of n minus 1, this is to transfer n disk, plus 1 for that 1 disk, and then m of n minus 1. So this I can simplify as 2 times m of n minus 1 plus 1. Right? So m of n in general is 2 times m of n minus 1 plus 1. And if we have only one disk to transfer, then there is no problem. We can do it directly in one step. So m of 1, where n is equal to 1, is 1. So this kind of expression of describing m n recursively in terms of smaller values of capital M is called a recurrence. Right? So we have a recursive expression for m n. Now we have to solve this. So the way we are going to solve this is to use a notion of repeated substitution. We are going to repeatedly use the same rule to simplify this expression until we reach everything in terms of m1 and then we can plug in the value 1. Right? So we start by the basic expression. So m of n is 2 times m n minus 1 plus 1. Now what we do is we substitute for m n minus 1 the same expression in terms of n minus 2. So m n minus 1 by the same expression is 2 times m n minus 2 plus 1. Right? Because in general for any m, we have mn is 2 times m of n minus 1 plus 1. Right? So this is a general expression. So we are taking, the, so we do this and we uh, simplify it. We get 2 times 2, so we get a 2 square coming from this, m n minus 2. And then we take 2 times 1, that gives us this 2, right, plus 1. Right? So we have just rewritten this as 2 square m minus 2. Now again, if we take this uh, expression, 2 times m n minus 2, that becomes 2 times m n minus 3 plus 1, and then this 2 square plus 1 is, is this 2 square remember is 4, so this I get a 4 inside and 2 square times 2 is 2 cubed, so I get 2 cubed m minus m n minus 3 plus 2 square plus 2 plus 1. Now you can see that if I do this k times, I will have 2 to the k m of n minus k. Remember everywhere that I have this and I have this, it's the same number. And this is 1 plus 2 plus 4, it next time will be 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8. So this is actually 2 to the k minus 1. So this is nothing but 2 cubed minus 1, this is nothing but 2 squared minus 1. Okay. So in general, after k steps, I have this. Now when I do this n minus 1 times, then n minus n minus 1 is nothing but 1, right? n minus n plus 1. So if I do this to n minus 1 times k is n minus 1, okay? then n minus k becomes 1, 
and this I have n minus one. So since n minus one is one, I can just omit it from this thing. So I have two to the n minus one plus two to the n minus one minus one. But this is nothing but two times two to the n minus one, which is two to the n. Right? So I can combine these as two to the n. Okay? So therefore, this gives us by this repeated expansion, substitution, whatever you'd like to call it, we have that m n minus m of n is two to the n minus one. In other words, it takes an exponential number of steps in order to solve this puzzle. Okay? So there is a very famous story by Arthur C. Clarke, which talks about this some temple where these pegs are there and it has 64 such disks and it says that the world will come to an end when the 64 disks are transferred. So you can think about how much time it will take to transfer two to the 64 disks in order to solve the puzzle with 64 disks. Remember we said that two to the 30 is about one billion, right? So this is an enormous amount of time. So I don't think we really need to worry about this as a serious problem if that is indeed the case. So to summarize, we have looked at some examples just to illustrate the flavor of how we apply the concepts we have studied in terms of Vigo in, in an actual algorithm. How do we look at an algorithm and actually extract its complexity? So for an iterative program, basically you focus on the loops, right? because the loops are what take up the time. And you have sometimes to be a bit clever about trying to understand how many times a loop executes. For recursive programs, we saw only one example. We will see more as we go along. But the main idea is you express the time complexity of the program as a recurrence. You write t of n, the time taken for n steps, in terms of a smaller value which is obtained from the recursive call. So for the Hanoi case, we had n and n minus 1. Right? So in order to solve the problem for n disks, we needed to solve the problem twice for n minus 1 disks. We will of course find examples which don't fit any of these. It will not be a simple loop that we can calculate. Okay? And then we will have to be a little more careful about how we actually count the operations. So in a sense, actually uh, estimating the efficiency of an algorithm is really like accounting. Right? So you are kind of keeping track of all the basic operations and you have to do a good job of making sure that you do the, uh, to keep track of them in the best possible way so that you get an accurate picture of the answer. 